was the transition from activism or community organizing to electoral work? And what did you like or find difficult about that transition? Oh, so I have said this many times. I am from Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, and there's not a lot of power in elections, right? Like, there are little things that can change depending on who's in power and how conservative they are, but real meaningful change that, you know, to better the lives of people um, is actually not very possible by voting for candidates in Puerto Rico because of our colonial status. So I grew up in a place where elections didn't matter all that much, and I learned that the thing that did change things was people organizing and building movements and, and, and coming up with concrete demands. So when I moved here, I had that mindset. It was, I, I, didn't, really, I didn't really get into electoral politics. Um, so after Bernie Sanders ran as a socialist, then there was an opening, right? All of a sudden, oh, he is talking about the things that we have been trying to get for so long through movements, and all of a sudden there was sort of like a, an opening to be able to connect electoral work with the movement work that we have been doing for so long. Um, so I think one of the most difficult things about being a candidate after I was convinced that it was the thing to do to run for office was um, the cult of personality that sometimes comes with with this kind of work because even though most of the people that were building my campaign were very understanding that we were doing this together, it is very hard to run an electoral campaign without you being the personality, right? The, the, the face that is out there and you have to perform in a certain way and that, that part is hard. You have to be on all the time yes. and you have to have every answer <laughs> and you're going to be criticized and you're going to be the target of like hateful comments and so I think uh, that was the hardest part for me to all of a sudden feel like I was the voice, I was the face even though when I was very aware that I was trying to uplift the voices of everybody. So in this election, we saw a big shift happen in the city council where a lot of uh, longtime machine politicians w were replaced by progressives and socialists. And I'm wondering uh, what you think the reasons are that your campaigns were successful um, this time around. And uh, so basically, why did you win? Uh, in my case, uh, for the benefit of those of you who are not from here, um, uh, we were against a dynasty, a family that had been running the 33rd ward for about 44 years. First it was the father and then the daughter. Father was there for 38 years and then the daughter was there for almost six. Um, and uh, we were against that, right? Uh, they were both white, so they were a white family that were running a ward that is 52% Latinx. Um, the reason why we won is because in 2015, a teacher, his name was Tim Megan, decided to challenge his dynasty. He was, he was the history teacher at Roosevelt High School, a school that had a history of disinvestment, um, and that was Starve of Resources. He decided to run um, because he wanted something different from his, for his school. He was the union member, um, he was incredible. He is incredible. He now lives in Minnesota. So a few of us um, that were crazy enough to believe that we could actually challenge this dynasty that had been there forever uh, worked on his campaign. And we organized, and we organized, and we organized, and we were 17 votes away from a runoff mm. with his daughter, Deborah Mel. And we actually did not know that we were gonna get so close. We actually ran the campaign because we wanted to send a message and we wanted to challenge, right? Um, and then, um, fast forward, uh, we, we decided to create, after we didn't win, um, we decided to create an organization called 33rd World Working Families and we spent four years organizing our community around education, um, around immigration, um, and around housing. So we started organizing around rent control, and we started organizing around a moratorium on charter schools, and we started knocking on doors for all of these things. Um, so we created a base of people that were very interested in these issues, people that were willing to fight for these issues. So when the time came to decide if we were going to run a candidate, I was asked to run, and I said no. 
um, <laughs> I said no a lot of times because this is the really scary thing to do. Um, so I was gonna go against this dynasty, and I am a Puerto Rican woman with a very thick accent um, and very brown. And in this community, even though brown people are the majority, brown people have the least amount of decisional power. Most of the people who actually vote in this ward are white and are wealthy. So we organized our hearts out <laughs> and uh, and we ended up winning, but the reason why we won is because we built movement for four years. It's because we created an organization that was able to bring people out. So at any given time, we would have canvases of 80 people on a Saturday that would come out and knock on doors. And just like Janet, like we knocked on doors so much. We knocked on doors on the coldest days. I remember one day I went out and it was, I think it was March. This was, we were already in the runoff. And like, oh, I won by 13 votes. Which tells you that every freaking door that you knock on is incredibly important, right? So um, one day I came out and it was so cold and it started raining and I had a poncho, but still the water was like getting into my sleeve. So I was getting all wet and it was cold and I almost started crying that day. I was like, I can't do this anymore. It was like the middle of March and it was so cold. And I remember Zach, who was somebody that used to knock on doors with me, he just like held my hand and he was like, we got this, we're gonna win. And I, we just kept knocking on doors and that day alone, I think, it, on that shift, I talked to about 16 people that said that they were gonna vote for us. And we won by 13 votes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was that day that I won the <laughs> But definitely the reason why we won is because we organized. One, one important thing about running campaigns is the money, right? And, and something that happened with us is that we were not taking money from big corporations or developers, which is, such a, a common thing in Chicago and all the people that we unseated were taking money from developers, right? Even if they try to hide it and <laughs> like come and flash it, right? Um, so, so the commitment of people coming out and knocking on doors, but also the commitment of people building um, uh, our campaigns by donating money and doing individual contributions of whatever people could is also one of the factors that push us to be able to win, right? And, and this particular election was really interesting because there were, there were people who spent like over a million dollars in their campaigns that were really scared that they were gonna lose, and they lost. <laughs> and they lost to people who spent like half or even less. way less than what they spent. So um, there is an economic power there as well that, that was powered by people, by just you know everyday people that donated. When, when we ran for office, um, I think our main idea was that we were going to access institutional power and then we were gonna throw a line out the door <laughs> so that people that have been disenfranchised could access that power and then do what they needed to do in order to be able to have good lives. Um, from participatory processes, uh, community driven zoning, um, participatory budget, um, yeah, budgeting uh, to work with menu money that we get, um, and, and, and other decisions that have to be made at a ward level, we are very committed to um, having people make those decisions, right, democratically, which is a, a, a different way from, from how it has been done. Um, I would also say that in my case, I have been really intentional now about the people that I have decided to hire as staff um, and the way and the kind of services that we are providing, right? Um, people are used to seeing the Aldermanic office as this place where the, I, there's like these services, right? Like you can get like a, a permit for moving and, <laughs> and no parking sign or but we are, we are trying to change a little bit the notion of what the aldermanic office um, can be used for. Um, I, I, one of the neighborhoods that encompasses my ward is Albany Park, and it's a highly immigrant neighborhood. There's a lot of undocumented people in my neighborhood. I want undocumented people to feel like they can come to my office and they can get services and they can get guidance in terms of the, the resources that they need in order to be okay. Um, 
So some of the people that I hired have been working with immigrant rights. Uh, I hired social workers because I understand that we need to be mindful of the trauma that a lot of people in our community has been facing. Um, but most importantly, the people that I hired from my office are all organizers, right? Because I want people to go out there and continue to help other people organize. Uh, people who, for example, are having issues with their landlord. This is a big one. When I, uh, before I ran for office, I went to my predecessor's office several times with neighbors that were being evicted from, from their buildings. And, and the alderman refused to sit down at the table with, with the developer that was kicking them out to negotiate uh, terms with them so that they could be relocated. Um, so that was a really big thing for me. When I saw the way that she reacted to these people coming to her, asking for help, most of them were Latino people. Most of them were undocumented. And they were going to be kicked out of the neighborhood where their children went to school, where they had a life. And that didn't matter because the developer was a campaign donor, so she decided to not touch it. I was sure that if we got, if we got the seat, we were going to be able to do something different. So the person that I hired for my superintendent is a housing organizer. Mm -hmm. And when we have war night, people come to us with issues with their landlords, and we have a complete process of how we deal with problematic landlords and slumlords. And we call them out, and we give people letters of support, and we call them, and we're gonna sit at the table, and we're going to figure this out, because you cannot treat your tenants like this, it's against the law. But that hasn't been done before, because politicians are scared of standing up to people like, like, like those slumlords, right? So we are trying to empower people who are suffering, people that are being disenfranchised and treated like garbage routinely, to understand that they do have power and that we are behind them and that we are going to support them. So I think that that is the way in which I try to balance <laughs> the, that organizing with the institutional situation now. Uh, so my last question, I wanted to kind of circle back to something Rosanna started with, which was talking about uh, when Bernie Sanders ran, and that kind of created this opening to talk about socialism and um, and fired up a lot of people, um, some of whom joined the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and in Chicago, there are 2,000 members. Um, so I wanted to ask, what you see the relationship between the socialist movement and socialist organizations as being with your campaign and um, whether that relationship has changed and where would you like to see that relationship go? Well, in my case, um, I, I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't call myself a socialist, even when I actually didn't know exactly what it meant, but it, to me, <coughs> um, because several people around me in my community call themselves socialists, to me, what it meant was that, I, what I always saw was that the people who called themselves the socialists were the ones who would always go and fight for the resources that belong to us. That is what I always saw. In my community, we didn't have running water in Puerto Rico, so the people who organized and who raised hell so that we could get water, they were the socialists. And then the people who started organizing in the labor movement, those were the socialists, right? The people that were fighting privatization, those were the socialists. So to me, socialism has always been something close to my heart, even when I didn't have all the theory to understand socialism as a whole. Um, so we, so my campaign was definitely run as a socialist campaign. Um, we were very clear that I was a socialist. I never hit that. The people who built my campaign, there was a lot of socialists building my campaign, and my commitment was always that after we won, if we got the seed, is that we were, we were going to continue to take cues from the movement, right? And a lot of those people in the movement are, um, are socialists. So right now, we yesterday, I was uh, meeting with DSA talking about the different campaigns that are going on and how we're going to be supporting those campaigns. Um, like, uh, for example, the democratization of Comed, or, um, or, or trying to fight against the, the immigrant um, uh, detention centers. So, so there's, a, or rent control, all of these campaigns are being spearheaded um, in, in a big way by, by a lot of socialist activists. 
Um, so we are doing that, but at the end of the day, I run for office so that people could get power, so that workers could get power, so that we can actually have agency over how we do the work and the resources um, that we need in order to survive and to live uh, good lives. Uh, so, so that's what we're going to do when we're in office. Yeah.